Hello, and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Express check-in. Today I'm recapping the last Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast live show, episode 32, Give Me an F. I am Mo Tuzano, the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, answering your gaming and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Ask the Bellhop. This week, it's all about local game stores and what differentiates a good one from a bad one. This topic is inspired by a question we got from one of our patrons, P.S. Goujon. He was looking for some great game stores in southwestern Ontario. Now, since many of you aren't located here, local to me, I decided to expand this topic a bit and talk about game stores in general. Now, on the main podcast, Sean and I discuss a number of things that make for a great game store. The kind of things that put the F in FLGS. Now, one of the biggest things is having friendly, knowledgeable staff. Far too often, I've walked into a store only to be ignored. The staff should be paying attention, say hi to everyone that walks in, offer to help or direct customers, plus know when to butt out when someone just wants to browse. With that, the staff should also know the stock they sell. They don't need to know every game in the store, but they should at least have some general knowledge. Things like knowing what are the hot new games. Plus, know where to find specific knowledge. Now, another option is to have different staff members that know different types of games. I've seen this work well. Now, one of the things that can make or break a game store is their game selection. Just offering to order anything I want in just makes me want to go home and order the stuff in myself from an online store. People want to pick stuff up, touch it, look at it, maybe even get to play it before they buy. This requires stocking a mix of the new hotness and timeless classics. Now this goes for board games, miniatures, RPGs, and card games. If, you ha- if all you have is D&D, I don't consider that a good RPG section of your store. Now another important feature of a friendly local game store is a place to play those new games. Every store Even a big warehouse-style store, I think, should have at least one table for showing off the new hotness or having demo nights. Now, a good game store is going to have lots of tables and lots of gaming space. Space that's well-lit, clean, and with comfortable chairs. Now, to keep those game tables full, I should be able to find some kind of schedule. Hopefully online as well as physically in the store. I expect to see Friday Night Magic. Nowadays, I better see Dungeons & Dragons Adventure League. To me, those are the two bare minimum. Every store should have those going on. But I should also find board game nights, demo nights, miniature gaming, painting clinics, organized play. Uh, Organized play from a variety of games, not just whatever the one big game in the area is, say Keyforge right now. I should find a lot of different things and there should be stuff going on almost every night of the week, if not every night of the week. Now, a part of making a gaming store welcoming and inviting is to keep it clean. Now, I'm not just talking about wiping down the tables and sweeping the floor. Like, behind the counter should be organized. There shouldn't be boxes everywhere. Washrooms should be spotless and cleaned at least daily. Garbages should be emptied. If I can see into a back room, it should look organized. It should be as clean as the rest of the store. Products should be dusted. And I gotta say, if you've got dusty product, maybe it's time for a sale. Now, if you've got people actually gaming in your nice, clean store, you better have something on hand for them to eat and drink. It doesn't have to be a full gaming cafe. Snacks and bottled drinks work, though I do love a good gaming cafe. Just be sure to offer some healthy options along with the sugary drinks and bags of salty chips. So those are my suggestions for what makes a good local game store. Now going back to P.S. Goujon's question, I will finish off with a short list of recommended stores. The CG Realm in Windsor, Ontario. RIW Hobbies in Livonia, Michigan. LA Mood Comics and Games in London, Ontario. And while in London, stop by down the street on Richmond to City Lights and look for used RPGs. A little further north, head to J&J Cards and Collectibles in Kitchener-Waterloo. Now, Sean recommends Black Knight Games in Hamilton. And if you are in the GTA, check out 401 Games. I've only been to the one downtown. It's fantastic, but I hear the one in Vaughan is even better. So what I want to know is what makes your friendly local game store special. Let us know down below in the comments. Also, remember to check out the full podcast for a more in-depth discussion of this topic, including a couple more game store recommendations and at least one more tip for something that makes a game store great. 
would like to take a moment to thank our new sponsor, Quiver Time. Makers of the Quiver Deluxe Card Carrying Case and other premium card game protection items. Head over to quivertime.com forward slash bellhop and use the code DING DING, D I N G D I N G, one word, to get 10% off their entire catalog. The RPG a Month Challenge has me trying to read one new RPG book every month. So far, I'm on track. The book I read for February was Shadow of the Demon Lord by Robert J. Schwalb. I really enjoyed reading this spiritual successor to 1st and 2nd edition Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay. It's not often a game exceeds my expectations, but this D20-based, grim, dark, horror fantasy game managed to pull it off. I dig the post-apocalyptic setting. It's the end of times. The demon lord's shadow is falling across the land. You are no hero. What do you do? This game starts off... You start off as a zero-level commoner, advanced through picking paths, starting off with just one of four basic novice paths, which then branch out into more and more options as the campaign progresses. Shadow of the Demon Lord combines traditional d20-based fantasy with modern sensibilities, like replacing the skill system with a professions, and having a system of banes and boons to replace all those plus one, minus one, plus two combat and situational modifiers. Now, to hear a lot more of my thoughts on this system, check out the full podcast. But even better yet, go to the extensive chapter-by-chapter review I wrote up on the blog at tabletopbellhop.com. Just click on Reviews, you should be able to find it. Now I've got a second review for you this week. Uh, i got to say one that's a little less positive. Last Monday I got a chance to play Jim Henson's Labyrinth board game from River Horse Limited. Sadly this game was uh, pretty much a total disappointment. Despite the rules sounding somewhat promising with RPG style elements like characters with different dice assigned to different skills and and a very solid team up mechanic to encourage cooperation this is not a good game. Uh, it's, a, it's a roll and move, pretty much entirely luck-based, where you just repeat the exact same actions over and over until you get lucky enough to find the right card. And that card just leads to more dice rolling. It's sad. Uh, sadly, the only thing good about this game is that it does come with some really nice-looking miniatures of the main characters. And to be honest, the only reason you should be picking this up is because you think the miniatures are worth the cost of the full game. Because the game itself, you can just toss out. So we did something rather different in our last Gloomhaven actual play, and that's that we didn't actually play Gloomhaven. Uh, Due to being not one, not two, but three players short, and me not being willing to start a totally new party with two brand new characters on short notice, we didn't play. But we have a schedule, and I wanted to stick to it and have something go live for our stream. So Sean, my podcast co-host, had the brilliant idea for the two of us to review the FAQ and errata for the game. So that's what we did. Sean and I went through the rather extensive and long Frequently Asked Questions thread on BoardGameGeek, going over most of the items one by one. We talked about what we thought of the different rules and discussed how they applied to our ongoing campaign. Now, I know I actually learned some things, and I think it's now a valuable resource for anyone who's playing Board Game Geek's number one rated game. Now, you can find an edited version of that live feed as a video right here on YouTube. Just check out our Gloomhaven playlist. And remember, we stream our Gloomhaven games nights every Friday at 8.30 p.m. Eastern, and you can join us over at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop to watch those. Tabletop Gaming Weekly, where we look back at the games that hit our tabletops in the last week. Now up first, I've got some more Dinosaur Island. This time, I broke open my totally liquid Extreme Edition expansion and tossed all those rules into the mix. Now the first thing Totally Liquid addresses is game length. Now I've mentioned this in the past as a problem with the game, and I'm pleased to say that Pandasaurus seems to have recognized the problem and fixed it by having all games, not just ones using the expansions, now require more objective cards to be in play at the start of the game. A simple fix that works really well. Now in addition to this change, Totally Liquid adds in more DNA dice, more specialists, a new lab upgrade, new plot twists. 
This stuff just gets tossed in with the base game, gets mixed in seamlessly. There are also rules and components for adding a fifth player. I'll admit I haven't tried those. Now along with that, there are a series of add-on modules that you can use individually or mix and match or toss them all in together. Now I've got way more detail on each of these in the full episode, but I will say I found them to be a bit of a mixed bag. The new aquatic dinosaurs seemed a little too random. The park extensions and CEOs add asymmetry, but they're the cost of a loss of focus on the main game and its goal. Now the PR cards and blueprints give players direction at the start of the game, and those were my favorite two modules out of the bunch, and these are two that I plan on using every game. Every game. Now over, I gotta say, it's a solid expansion. I think there's enough good here to warrant a purchase. And with the mix of modules, I have a feeling there's people out there that are going to dig a totally different mix than I do. And that there's probably a mix there and a module for everyone. I think it's kind of interesting to see that. And I think it's an interesting way to market the, the box that way so that there's probably something everyone can enjoy. Now, while I was getting my feet wet with this expansion, Sean was back in the DC universe. Specifically, the Arrow universe with the crossover pack 2 expansion for the DC Comics deck building game. He noted this expansion did a great job of using a downplayed mechanic from the base game. That's the one of Secrets. He also noted how this tied in really well thematically with the Arrow TV series. And I've got to say, I'm always impressed when designers are able to tie theme to mechanics this well. Now the other big game I played was another epic game of Zaya, Legends of a Drift System, with all my shiny new Kickstarter goodies. This was a four-player, 15-point fame, 15 fame point game with two new players, a total of four. It was epic, lasting about 4.5 hours, and we all had a fantastic time. Now, the big thing this play did for me was reinforce my feelings on the Embers of a Forsaken Star expansion. This really is a must-have. It fixes so many little things from the base game, but also adds so many awesome new things. I noted on the main show that I honestly think they should just bundle the two together from now on so that you get Zaya with this, so no one out there is going to buy Zaya and not end up with Embers and be disappointed. They just should always ship together at this point. Now, due to a plethora of snow, snow days up the 401, Sean got in even more deck building last week with his kids. Uh, the second game day was spent exploring the Rogues expansion, uh, which is crossover pack number five. I couldn't help to notice that Sean's not going in order here, is he? But anyway, I, he explained that the twist with Crossover 5 was that you got to play the villains. Though I guess B and C rate villains, no Jokers or Dark Sides here, more like Mr. Frost. What I found interesting was that Sean's family managed to mix up the cards between the two sets they've been using and ended up using the wrong villains. Now what's really cool about this is that it worked. That's one of the cool things about this cryptozoic deck building engine, as they call the Cerebus engine, is that you can mix and match sets, and it's cool to hear that it seems to work in practice as well as in theory. Now, Sean finished off his week in review with a heartwarming story about his son teaching their copy of DC Deck Builder to one of his friends. That is a fantastic moment for any gamer dad to witness. I love hearing about that. Now, as usual, this weekly look back just scratches the surface for a more detailed discussion about these games, be sure to check out the full podcast when it goes live Tuesday mornings at 2 a.m. Eastern, both here on YouTube and on your favorite podcatcher. Do you have a gaming or game night question you would like us to tackle in a future Ask the Bellhop segment? You can send those questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or just head over to the website tabletopbellhop.com and click on Ask the Bellhop. Remember that we record a new episode of the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast every Wednesday night at 9.30 p.m. Eastern, and we would love it if you joined us on Twitch in our chat room, which we call The Lobby. Now, if you enjoy the content we're providing, it would be awesome if you would consider tipping the bellhop at patreon.com forward slash tabletop bellhop. Thank you for joining me for this episode of Express Check-In. You can always find us all across the web and social media as Tabletop Bellhop, one word, or drop by our website at tabletopbellhop.com for more gaming content. Be sure to subscribe to our channel by clicking over here, or check out our latest video by clicking over here. Even better, do both. 
I am Mo Tuzano, the Tabletop Bellhop, your Cardboard Concierge. Good night and game on.